You are. I think what happens is you actually have two different accounts. You might have checked in twice. I'll, I'll fix it later. Okay. Shh. All right, everyone, welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, special hello, my mom, Iris and Jamie here. So just say hi to them. They come to my class. Where did you in my class before I had? They came in it's two years ago, right? Okay, very good, very good. So you might recognize some of the faces. They're here. They, uh, they check and see if you're on Facebook or not, see if you're paying attention. So they'll be my eyes and ears. They're visiting, uh, visiting from New York. Uh, please check in attendance if you can. A bunch of you haven't checked in yet. Um, if anyone needs a name tent card, I have them up here in a marker. Because you didn't come to my office when I said you should. So you can oh, use this. I, 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 I have one. It's just in my book. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Okay, okay, excuse me. Oh, oh, okay, it's right there. Well, now you have a new one. That's fine. Um, okay, any questions in general? Anything on your mind? Uh, from last class, we covered uh, the freedom of the press with fairness doctrine and right of reply. Anything? No? Okay. All right, so our new topic today is a perfect one for my parents to visit on, which is obscenity, I swear. I didn't plan it this way, but uh, no. I didn't tell them everything I'd be teaching tonight, but it'll, it'll, it'll come out eventually. Um, so far, all the cases we've done have concerned the rights of the speaker, right? The right of a person to give a speech, the right of a person to print a pamphlet, the right of a person to burn a flag or burn a draft card. The right of the person to uh, protest a funeral, right? All these cases have involved the right of the person actually speaking. And they've conveyed their message in different formats, with the spoken word, with the written word, with conduct that expressive elements, like burning a flag. But the cases today are a little bit different, right? These cases don't involve the rights of the pornographers, the people filming the movie. They don't involve the right of the, call them actors and actresses, the people in the films, right? These cases involve the right of someone to look at those pictures or to watch the movies or to read whatever, you know, obscene materials there are. And all of these cases assume a question that I don't think is so easy to assume. Why does the freedom of speech protect the right to read or the right to watch or the right to listen, right? Why isn't the freedom of speech just the right to speak? Right, I'm talking to you, I'm engaging in speech, you're just sitting there taking notes and listening. Do you have a right to hear me speak? And, and this is a question that the court, I think, just jumps over. They just assume that the right to receive information is equal to the right to convey the information. And I want to I wanna discuss this for a little bit and we'll see where it goes. Um, who's, who's up next? Mom and dad are not on call today. All right, Alec, what do you think? Why? Are you up? You're next? No, I'm the answer. All right, you're next. Alex, um, why, why would the First Amendment, the freedom of speech, protect the right to receive information, the right to watch or listen or read, versus speaking it? Why would it? Yeah. The court just says it. They don't really explain why. They simply assume it's the case. But why, why should it protect the right to receive information? Everybody has a right to be able to receive information. I feel like if, 
it, it, infringe on our ability to live a free and open life. But if the amendment's about the freedom of speech, where, why does that entail the freedom to listen and hear? Why is that a... Speech is auditory, auditory. So what? Right. We can allow you to speak, and if you listen to it, we'll punish you. Right? We can let the person make the movie or make the book, and then if you read it, we'll punish you. Why? The point I'm getting is why? Why is the receiving the information worth protecting constitutionally? I, mean, I wouldn't necessarily... I don't, have, you know, I don't have to want to hear what you say, but I would be, I would be hearing it nonetheless. Katie, you want to take a step? I would say that it, like you have a right to convey information and ideas and it impedes upon your right to do that if you can't receive it in the first place. Oh, say it again. I think you're on something. All right. What do you what do you mean impede? Just give me a little bit more on impede. If, if, I mean, if, there, if, you, I mean like if it's a crime to receive certain types of information, that information will never get to you and you can't uh. All right, so let me, let me just unpack Katie's comment for a minute. I think she's on the right track, right? Imagine we lived in a world where you could write whatever book you want, you could print whatever pamphlet you want, but you couldn't distribute it. You had an audience with a size of zero, right? You could say whatever you want in the privacy of your home. You could print whatever you want in your diary or your journal. But if you distribute it to someone else, you can be arrested. You have an audience of zero. What is the value of speaking, <laughs> right, Dad? Unless someone can hear you, right? If you're talking to no one at all, you may as well have your mouth shut. So I think that's, that's the general direction, right? To have a conversation, it takes two, or at least two, it could take more, right? To have any sort of dialogue or discourse, you need a speaker and a listener. To be an author, you have to have a, or someone who writes and, and, a, and a reader. To have a movie, pornographic or otherwise, you have to have someone in acting in the movie and then someone to watch it. So the courts have held, and they didn't really develop this in the case, so that's why I want to draw it out from all of you, that the First Amendment includes not only a right to speak and convey information, but a right to receive it, right? Even though the receiver, the recipient, is not engaging in speech himself, right? He's merely possessing a book or a film strip or a movie or whatever else he's possessing, all right? I saw a few other hands. Anyone else want to add something to this? I said a few other hands. Yeah, Cameron. Well, one thing, let me ask that question I've been thinking you know, wherever we hear things like freedom of speech, you always mm -hmm. kind of view it as like that's the first amendment, but there's so much more to it. Yep. You know, around it, you have things, you know, the establishment of religion and then freedom of the press and combine them like saying, well, someone like a journalist has the right to speak <coughs> what the news is, but they can't like put it in a newspaper for someone to read. Well, the journals can print the newspaper, but the government can censor the paper, right? Or they can just make it a crime to buy this newspaper. Or then like with religion, where you have, you know, the holy books that come with oh. most religions. You so say you can write the, the Bible or the Torah, but then the government would have the right to keep you from reading it, which would kind of... Be okay, but now let me, let me, let me come back to uh, Harrison, right? Yeah. Harrison, let me, ask, let me ask this question, right? Why is it so problematic for the government to tell you what you can or can't read. We'll get to pornography in a minute. That may be a little bit of a different situation, right? But why is it so problematic when the government tells you, you can't read this book? What, what's the purpose of that sort of law? Um, because that, I think a couple things, but I think that once you start saying that you can't read something, you enter a dangerous gray area of what is permissible or not. And also, well, what, what do you mean, what is permissible? Why is that dangerous when we tell you you can't read this book? Um, because just because it may be offensive doesn't mean it doesn't have any artistic or scientific. But, basic question, why would the government tell you that you can't read a book? What's the purpose of that sort of law? Um, there's some sort of detriment, underlying detriment to you know, the government. Okay. Society. Yeah, uh, government, yeah. yeah. I was going to say maybe the idea that the book is portraying, they're trying to diffuse it. They're trying to what? Diffuse the, diffuse idea. the idea. Yeah. Gerald, 
what, when the government says you can't read a book, what, or newspaper, whatever, right? Why, why would such a law exist? What's the purpose of such a law? Distinguish any spark of like rebellion. Oh, to put down rebellion, I think diffuse. Uh, I think uh, Gabe's getting at a similar topic, right? But Cameron, you're next. You're perfect, right? Does telling someone they can't read a book diffuse or to put down rebellion? Does it actually accomplish its goal? I mean, everyone knows you say not to watch something. Nobody's going to watch it. Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> my dad tells me, Josh, don't do that. That's exactly what I'm going to do. I do the exact opposite of what you tell me to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> So we have a situation. Yeah, yeah, Colby. Oh, it was just, it came up to me like when you asked a question about the 70s, and, uh, Georgia was the controlling, the government would be trying to control someone's thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Bingo. Controlling thoughts. I like the way you just put that. I think that was from Justice Marshall's opinion also, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about it, the way human beings grow and develop and nurture is by learning, right? We all learn the day you stop learning, you're probably dead, right? And we learn different ways. We can learn by reading a book or having a conversation or watching a movie or sitting in class, whatever. The sorts of cases we have today are premised on a notion that if we stop people from learning about X, we'll have a better society, right? If only we keep these dirty images, right, out of people's minds, our society will be better. Which is why the First Amendment's implicated. Even though these cases involve pornography and obscenity, and whatever else you want to call it, at bottom, when they say you can't read this, you can't look at this, it's a matter of thought control. Colby, I think, said it well a moment ago. They're saying that these thoughts are okay to have, and those thoughts are not. Now, if you want to imagine things in your head by yourself, we can't stop you. But we can stop materials that could encourage those thoughts, that can cultivate those thoughts. That if we keep these materials out of your hand, then maybe you won't have these dangerous thoughts which will make our society more immoral, or degraded, or promiscuous, or whatever, whatever, whatever word you want to use. All right, does anyone else have a thought on this one? Okay, so the reason why the reason why we have this right to receive information is to prevent the idea of thought control. That if we limit the First Amendment to the speaker, that allows a whole range of restrictions on the recipient. Right? Yes? <clears throat> There's an economic factor also. Hmm? The creator of the material is depriving hmm. him oh, God. of livelihood. So I love it. Kind of shut. I love it. Right. This is basically Lochner, right? You have the right of the baker. I was, perfect, Dad. Good, good comment, right? When you deprive the audience the right to listen, you're killing the speaker's business, right? In California, just think about this for a minute, right? I'll, I'll jump ahead to Miller for a minute. In California, they made it a crime to ship through the mail's obscenity, right? So that poor guy who made all these obscene films and magazines can't ship his inventory. Right? So you are depriving him of an audience, even though in that case, he sends it to the poor mom with his, the restaurant. Yeah, yeah Nathan. I was going to say, he was shipping it to people that didn't order it, though, right, in that case? Allegedly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, whoops. It's like, <laughs> I'll get my parents' facts. So the facts of this case is a later case where uh, this gentleman was owning a restaurant with his mom, and then in the mailbox appears all this obscene material. And they say, where did this come from? Well, oh, I don't know. And they, they go to the police. So it's possible the son may have actually uh, <clears throat> ordered it. We don't. I'm, I'm making it up, but it's possible, right? <laughs> Colby. So what's the difference here like, with them banning certain things and then local school boards banning books from schools? OK. So he asked a good question, right? He asked about banning books from schools. Um, Books in schools is actually a, a, a complicated topic uh, because it generally involves government speech. 
right? When you go to a Texas public school or any public school, they decide what you learn. They decide the textbooks. Um, they decide the curriculum, right? You know, I grew up in New York. We didn't have Texas history. That wasn't a thing. We didn't learn about it. I know you all do. Uh, we didn't have New York history either. We didn't really, there's no patriotism in New York. It doesn't exist. <laughs> um, but when you assign a book in a curriculum, that's generally within the school's control. Now, a school library is a little bit different, precisely because that's the extracurricular. It's not in the same uh, category as government speech. So the, the banning of the books isn't, generally doesn't violate the First Amendment. Those, those cases tend to lose. But the reason why the book banning becomes so controversial uh, is because it's about controlling speech. That if we save the children from reading about these dangerous concepts, they will preserve themselves in their innocence and purity and not have these awful thoughts. And, you know, I mean, lots of books have been banned that, that are fairly mundane. You know, you have, you know, the Dyer Van Frank, right, or, or the Communist Manifesto, or, 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 you know, even a lot of J.D. Salinger's works have been banned over the years. Um, you know, Kurt Vonnegut stuff. I mean, the, the, you know, books that we consider pretty core staples at times were considered. Uh, 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 far too dangerous. You'll read a case um, later this semester called Brown versus EMA. You may have already read it with me, involving video game violence. And Justice Scalia makes a point to say that we have violent video games, video games today. We've long had very violent books, right? And the Brothers Grimm. You read the original Brothers Grimm fairy tales. These are not pleasant, mm -hmm. right? I think I think was it um, was it with with, with, uh, with with Cinderella? I think uh, they, they actually chop off toes to fit the foot inside the slipper, right? It's pretty it's pretty gruesome stuff. Um, so I think Colby, your your point as well taken. The purpose of banning books in a curriculum is to control thought. Yeah, yeah, Gabe. So, uh, so regulating books is not as restricted as a student speech in the public school. Well. <laughs> There are different issues, right? One, what books are on a school curriculum. Two, what books might be available in a school library, right? I think, I think those are different issues. And three, if a student comes to class and makes some sort of comment, can he be punished for making that comment, right? Those are, these are three separate issues. I think you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta disentangle. Yeah, Alec? I was gonna say, uh, the difference between like public and private education, it's, it's like private education, I guess, has more leeway. Oh my goodness! At a private school, the students are are, are serfs. They have no rights. Yeah. Like you, you all, for example, you have no first amendment rights. I, you can't sue me for anything. Well, not 1983 at least, right? I, I can't violate your rights in my current capacity. I'm not able to. I'm not a government officer in any capacity. So I hand there, mom. What about children on, on the uh, networks in schools, the internet? Children. Right. I mean that 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 that's exactly the same idea as limiting the books in the library. Right, um, a, a somewhat funny story, funny not funny. Uh, does the name Alex Kaczynski ring a bell? Judge? Yeah, I'll keep not paying attention, it's good. So he, he was a judge of some prominence. He retired recently, he had his own uh, allegations of sexual harassment, just Google him. Uh, but, but many years ago, um, he complained that the federal courts were putting an internet filter on the judge's computers and that the judges couldn't access websites that they wanted to, and he made a big stink. The reason why it's somewhat uh, not so funny is that he got busted because he had a private internet server, not in his bathroom, he had a private internet server with all these obscene images on it. Uh, they, it wasn't obscene, but they were very sexually suggestive graphics, and, and then he had to retire because of his comments of human law clerks and things he said and did. So, but the point is, federal judges complain about the filtering. Just, just Google Kaczynski and you'll, you'll see it. Uh, I don't have time for it. I'm sorry? No, you're thinking of Judge, it was that Judge, uh, uh, he was another judge who had to resign under scandal. Was it no, Portius or no, that was one in Louisiana? There was a judge in Galveston, I can't remember his name. Judge Costa replaced him. I don't remember the guy, but you're right. All right, so we get the idea of thought control, right? So let's go on to the first case, Stanley against Georgia. Uh, how many of you took Crim Pro already? Okay, almost all of you, so I'll, I'll give you a, a basic Introduction. Um, I'm sorry? Thank you. You're wearing a hat today. I've never seen you without a hat. I lost it in a windy tunnel downtown on my bike. You lost your hat in a tunnel? I've never seen you without a hat. I've had you for like two years in class. Okay, fair enough. All right. 
It's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll survive. So the Fourth Amendment, I'll just mention this briefly, has a requirement for a warrant, right? If the police want to search your stuff, they need a warrant. But the warrant has to be what's called particularized. That is specific, right? In other words, if you want to search someone's garage, you can't have a warrant for their driveway, right? Or if you want to search a file cabinet, they can't search under your bed, right? A warrant must be particularized for a specific place. And that's why the judge has to sign off on, I think there's probable cause that there's evidence of a crime in this spot, in this location. And you have cases where, say, the officer writes the wrong address, right? It's 145 instead of 147, right? They can't search the wrong house. This case should have been a Fourth Amendment case. Uh, they had a warrant to look for evidence of gambling, right? Bookmaking. That's what their warrant was for. It's find evidence of bookmaking. Okay. Kyle, what did the search turn up in this case in, in Stanley? Some films. Films. Pornographic materials, right? Did the warrant have anything to do with pornographic materials? Nope. Could they have seized this evidence? Could they have seized the evidence? Given the fact they had no warrant for films? Yeah. So there was a concurring opinion, I don't think it's in your book, from uh, Justice Stuart Brennan White, and they argue that this entire case should have been a Fourth Amendment case. Um, the evidence should not have been admissible. And the funny, uh, funny. So the facts of this case, I think as we all know, they go to Stanley's house with a search warrant for gambling evidence. They don't find any evidence of gambling, but they found three reels of eight millimeter film. Uh, if you don't know what this is, it's the old film strips, you know, things that spin, you know, you project it on a wall. So what the police do <laughs> when they found these three strips of film, <laughs> they spend 15 minutes watching it. <laughs> <laughs> please help us, please. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that. Uh, do you know? No, I'm, I'm assuming they like, held it up to the light and saw, like. Yeah, I, I mean, it's not like a DVD. You can't just look at it. It's not like a label on it, right? Yeah, no, it's basically like the film strip. Yeah, so I mean, I, but I think Ryan's right. You can kind of hold up to the light and look and see what's on there. Yeah, yeah, it's basically, if you've ever seen a negative, they've never seen that, Mom. A, a film negative, they don't even know what that is. Come on. Uh, yeah. Film. A couple people might, but who here has never developed film? Probably not your mom. You actually developed film yourself. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So you have this little strip, the negative. You can kind of look up to the light and see what it is. So I don't know, Gabe, but they at least found it was a good use of their law enforcement time. To spend an hour in this guy's bedroom watching porn on his wall. <laughs> I mean, just, there, it's not like you can plug into a DVD player. You have to get a projector, put down a, a screen, turn the lights off because it's hard to see. It's black and white. And just sit there. I don't know if there's popcorn. And they were watching this. And then, and then they arrested the guy. They arrested the guy. They tried to have given him a tip or something. You know, to, but anyway, so this entire case was kind of bizarre, right, from the outset. And this probably should have been a conviction, I'm sorry, inadmissible evidence under the Fourth Amendment. I think we, we can all agree on that, but that, that's not the basis on which uh, the state proceeded. Um, they charged him with possession of an obscene matter. Okay? And at the outset, this is a Justice Marshall opinion. This might be the only Marshall opinion, maybe one or two others, not many Marshall opinions that are left. We just don't have many of them. Uh, Justice Marshall says the Constitution protects the right to receive information and ideas. And he cites Griswold. Who knows why he cites, I mean, you may not have had me for con law, but I'm sure you say Griswold v. Connecticut. Why is Griswold the case to cite for the right to receive information and ideas? My goodness. Kyle. Um, that's an actor being educated on how to. Yes. Yes. Bingo. Exactly. Yeah. That was a case on receiving information on how to use birth control, right? They weren't just giving them pharmaceuticals. They were educating them on how to use birth control. So they actually say that Griswold, the, 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 the penumbra case, right, the substantive due process case, is the right to receive information on how to use birth control. Man, the citations back then were loosey-goosey, but that's the case they cite. Why? Because there was no good case saying that, right? 
Historically, all the cases involved the rights of the speaker, not the right of the recipient. And that's where they have to fudge it with Griswold. It's not a good case, right? But that's, that's the best case they can come up with. He also says, Pierce v. Society of Sisters. My goodness. Remember that case? That's where they tried to shut down the Catholic schools. What? Uh, that, that, that's um, uh, Meyer v. Nebraska. But Pierce was a case they shot, tried to shut down the Catholic school in, uh, uh, God, was it, uh, was it uh, Washington State, I think. Okay. Justice Marshall writes, this right to receive information, ideas, regardless of their social worth, is fundamental to our free society. Okay? But I want to focus on that aside, right? Social worth. I think, Dana, you're next. Dana, what does it mean for speech to have social worth? What does that mean? It means it contributes something to society. Okay. Whether it's good or bad. Okay. Does defamation have social worth? It's libel. Not according to the law. Well, why not? You have to agree with it or not, but why, why would defamation not have social worth? Are lies not protected? Is it just enough to lie? Why is defamation? Does defamation have any social worth? Mm. Um, so it has repercussions of damaging the people and their business. Ah, there, there's the key, right? It's not just that it's a lie, because actually we'll do a case later this semester. The Constitution protects the right to tell a fib, a lie. But it's a lie that injures a person's reputation, so we say it's perhaps not um, worthwhile. Uh, we've talked about the fighting words doctrine, whatever the status of that is. We say the fighting words perhaps are not protected uh, because they force you to engage in violence. But that brings us to obscenity, right? Oops, hello. Dick Tracy, right? Dick Tracy is. Um, it's, it's okay. But that brings us to obscenity. And usually when we talk about the categories of unprotected speech, we mention fighting words, we mention defamation, we mention obscenity. Right? Wait, why, why is obscenity considered speech that lacks social worth, that, that speech that is not entitled to any sort of uh, protection? What, just as it, before we get to defining obscenity, that's the second case, that's Miller. But why, as a general matter, should obscenity not be deemed to have any social worth? Oh, this chair sucks. Yeah. I don't know. Um, to me, it, it seemed like they weren't saying that, I guess. No, I know they weren't, but I'm asking as a general matter. In Roth, the case that's sort of cited in the past, right? right? Why? What's the. And you haven't read it, so I'm not asking you to give me that case, but why would obscenity not have social worth? Just what's the general argument there? Just the whatever underlying moral issue you have with it, it kind of degrades your sense of values or what you're teaching the young and passing on to people. Um, and some people might have the right to not see it. Oh, we'll get, that, that's Miller. We talk about the right to hear. Miller's the right to not hear. I'll do that in the next case. I'll come back to that. But Colby, let me, let me just focus on this for a minute, right? Why does obscenity, by the way, obscenity and pornography are different. You should know this by now, right? Porn's fine. Obscenity's not. Where the line is, that's Miller. That, that's the line. But Colby, why would you say obscenity has no social worth? corrupts people's minds, but isn't that, isn't that like supply and demand? If people didn't want it, it wouldn't exist. That is, this stuff exists because people want to watch it. Is, isn't the fact that people want it evidence that it has worth to society? No. No, why not? People didn't want it, no one would listen to it, but if people want it, that means it's evidence that society values it. There's a price tag on it, you can buy it in a store. Park in the back. I think it's based off. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of people got that. It's like, oh, yeah, that's what you used to do, right, for the internet. <laughs> uh, I think it 
societal worth is based off the individual person looking at the looking at what the material is. Okay, but Georgia disagreed, right? When Georgia banned it, they made a judgment call that this is not this is not worthwhile, right? So, Marissa, let me ask this question. Uh, we've talked in the past about uh, the void for vagueness doctrine, right? This is the idea that the due process clause limits criminal laws. That if they want to put me away in jail, I have to know what's expected from me. We say that ignorance of the law is no excuse. That's fine. But that's premise of knowing what the law is. So Marissa, if, if Georgia has a statute that makes it a crime to have obscene material, how am I supposed to know the line between pornography, which is fine, and then obscenity. How, how, how the heck am I, I mean, how? Um, I guess you wouldn't know. There's no way to know if they hadn't drawn the line yet. Yeah, yeah. So th there, there are a lot of problems with the obscenity doctrine. Uh, the famous quotation, you probably heard it but not in the correct context, is from Potter Stewart. The idea that, you know, obscenity, I know it when I see it. Um, it varies. I think Miller tries to clear that up, but at least for Mr. Georgia, I'm sorry, for Mr. Stanley, um, there's no there's no bright line of any sort. There's no clarity of why his material might be a scene and otherwise. Um, the court doesn't address any of those issues in 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 uh, in Stanley. They just don't touch it. In fact, they don't even say whether it's obscene or not. That that's not important, right? Instead, Justice Marshall takes a very sharp turn. He does it very quickly. And if you move, if you blink, you miss it. All right, Christine, what's the analysis that Justice Marshall looks at? He's not asking whether it's obscene or not. What's the argument he, he actually draws? Oh. All right, what, what, what argument does he actually draw? What, what's Marshall's opinion? What, he doesn't say this information is not obscene. What information... So what, what conclusions he draw? In other words, does it matter if this material is obscene or not in this case? No. Okay, it doesn't matter. That's right. Why does it not matter? Why would the mere possession of these movies impede on a person's individual liberty? What about possession? And precisely, Christine, where is he possessing these films? What's special about that? Why, why is the fact that it's in his house important? Okay, now we're getting somewhere. I'm going to skip these three because I think I already called on these guys. Uh, Brittany, is there a difference, you think, under Stanley between selling pornography in a store or projecting it in a public theater versus watching it in, in, in your own bedroom. What, what do you think the difference is? Um, watching it in your own home and having the government come in as an invasion of your personal liberty. Why? What, what's that word that was very, very timely in the 1960s? If you remember back from Common Law. Um, what was Griswold about, if you remember back there? Was this about the right of anyone to get contraception? No. Privacy, right? Privacy, bingo. Right? And David, who in Griswold was trying to get the, the, the contraception? Was it just anyone off the street? Uh, I don't really remember the note. Uh, anyone remember? Yeah, Dave? Husband and, wife Husband and wife. Yeah. Griswold decided, I think, what, in 66, 67, just check on the year, a couple years before Stanley, um, maybe even that same year. Um, 65, thank you. So a couple of, four years for, for uh, Griswold, uh, before Stanley. These cases involve the so-called right of privacy in the bedroom between the husband and the wife. And the court sketches out that this is something special. Justice Marshall writes, this is a drastic invasion of personal liberties. He writes, whatever may be the justifications for other statutes regulating obscenity, 
For example, shipping it through the mail, displaying it in a movie theater, right? Publishing it in a printing press, whatever it is. Whatever those other laws might be, we do not think they reach into the privacy. That's the magic word, right? Privacy of one's own home. Okay? So Justice Marshall says, if the First Amendment means anything, it means that a state has no business telling a man sitting alone in his own home what books he may read, or more precisely, <laughs> what films he may watch. This was not about books, this was about films. Our whole constitutional heritage rebels as the thought of giving government the power to control men's minds. This is Colby's comments from a few minutes ago, right? By telling you what you can do in your bedroom, you're trying to control their mind. Now, I can extend that just as quickly to a lecture hall or a theater or mailing stuff, right? Because think of it this way. Couldn't the government just make it a crime to buy this material? Would that be any different for Mr. Stanley? He couldn't have it in his bedroom. In other words, are they actually committed to this holding, right? Can he order direct mail to have this stuff shipped to his house? It was a crime to obtain the information, but it wasn't a crime merely to possess it. So this was, I think, a very narrow, narrow, narrow holding um, because they couldn't really decide on what obscenity was, right? They couldn't get a um, majority of the court to say, this is not obscene. They could have, but they didn't have the votes. So instead, they had the super narrow ruling saying, well, whether or not it's obscene doesn't matter because you have the right to keep it in your home. Again, this is a very narrow ruling. Gabe, you don't you look, look upset with this one. Yeah, but <laughs> wouldn't it be hard to define obscenity back in the 60s when you know, TV and was seen more colorful and some people may not appreciate a woman in nudity as opposed to other people find body on it? Yeah, I mean, you're talking Miller, which was about four or five years later, right? Um, let me put it this way, right? Uh, go, go, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Gabe. We'll deal with it later. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think, I think Gabe's on to something, right? Let. Marshall's saying, let's just deal with this narrow question here of in the home, and then maybe later we'll deal with the, uh, the Miller test. Because I think it ultimately comes down to the Fourth Amendment. To me, there's a warrant for that, for, for that specific thing. So because we didn't have that, you cannot just tag along and say, well, they weren't supposed to do this to begin with. So let's just kind of... Yeah, I mean, it, it should have been a Fourth Amendment case, Elvin, that I think the correct way of doing it. Um, but I think Marshall did not want to... And, you know, also, if you think about it, what if there was like a 5-4 decision on what obscenity was and the next year of another justice goes the other way? This is a serious issue that would come up. Um, I think I mentioned this earlier, but at the Supreme Court, back in these times, they actually had a movie theater in the basement. It wasn't a theater. It was a little room with a projector. And there'd be all these cases about whether a given movie was obscene. And the justices, these nine men, well, actually eight, would sit there and watch these pornos in the Supreme Court. If you ever go to the Supreme Court, I figured out where it was. It was a room right behind the John Marshall statue. It's now like a visitor center with like exhibits and stuff. But the SUV theater used to be there. Um, actually, it was seven watching, because Justice Harlan was basically blind, but he went anyway, <laughs> I guess, you know, to listen. I don't know. Uh, and Justice Hugo Black would never watch it, um, because he believed that all the films protected by the First Amendment, so he would never watch them anyway. Um, but, you know, you actually have judges watching pornographic films decide if they're obscene or not. I, I, my mom's laughing. Good. It's nuts. It's crazy, right? Yeah, exactly. It's crazy. Very different times, yeah. If you remember the 60s, you weren't there, as they say. <laughs> That's a Robin Williams joke, which I, I didn't make up. Uh, <laughs> love you. Okay. Um, 
But at bottom, the court says that Georgia does not have the right to control the moral content of a person's thoughts. And the mere fact that exposing people to information may lead them to deviant crimes, that's not enough. Just by the way, recall that in uh, Griswold, the court actually said that the state can ban basically like, you know, sexual conduct outside of marriage, fornication, right? The state could actually criminalize filming pornographic movies because it was fornication, but they couldn't criminalize keeping it in the home. Okay. Important case uh, uh, to development, but doesn't really go too far. All right, any questions on Stanley against Georgia? Yeah, Cameron. The thing that was just really kind of bugging me as I was reading it is that he always just referred to it as obscene film. Yep. Kind of obscene, and it discussed it such a, a wide, but I eventually I figured it was a pornographic film and looked it up. But was there any particular reason why he never specified it was? I think Gabe's comment a minute ago reflects it. They didn't want to define whether it was obscene or not because they didn't have to discuss the test for obscenity. Mm -hmm. So they just don't even discuss the, the facts. I've actually tried, oh God, I've read the opinion, didn't go much further than that, but I, I've looked into what actually was the content and I can't, I don't know. In the next case, they actually describe it, at least at a high level of abstraction. Uh, I got stuff for you later, it'll be worse. We'll go into details, make me uncomfortable with my parents, but this case, they did not want to discuss it. I mean, I just want to give you a sense of how prudish the Supreme Court was, uh, there's a case called Cohen versus California, which I think it may have assigned a couple years ago. Um, you had this hippie who walked into courthouse and his jacket said, fuck the draft. Right, that's what his jacket said. Now, when we say the F word now, it has like no meaning because we just drop F-bombs every five seconds. But back in the 60s, to walk into court with a thing saying, fuck the draft, that was a big deal, right? That gets your attention, right? Um, at the Supreme Court, when the case was being argued, the lawyer gets up and the Chief Justice goes, Mr. Whatever, we're familiar with the facts, right? Why do you say that? He didn't want him dropping F-bombs in the Supreme Court. <laughs> the lawyer was like, fuck that. <laughs> he was just cursing the entire time because he wanted to make the point that the reason why you said, fuck the draft instead of damn the draft was to get attention and to shock people's conscience. That's why it was such an important message, you know, to the, the, the counterculture to, to, you know, down with Whitey, whatever it was, right? You wanted to shock the conscience. That's why you did it. All right, any other questions on Stanley? Yeah, what? I was just curious if the same classification for obscenity extends to um, kind of the cases that you were dealing with, with possession of um, the online documents on printing <laughs> guns, or if that's a completely different standard. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so we, had a, we actually lost the case, but, but uh, I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. Um, on jurisdictional grounds, not a thing on the merits, but um, the, uh, the judge found we lacked personal jurisdiction. We, 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 ref, we, we refiled somewhere else, so we're, we're dealing with that now. But the judge, I was actually telling the judge that the category of protected speech is very broad. And I said, uh, you know, the sorts of files we've had with 3D printed guns have been displayed in museums. And the judge says, well, wait a minute, Josh, you know, you can call me Josh, Mr. Black, but you know, isn't that a lot of protected speech? The speech has very little value. He said, Your Honor, that's Miller. Uh, I'm sorry, but Miller's a very broad test. But virtually everything's protected and sort of walked away from that. But the answer is yes, right? I was citing Miller in court in this exact issue. Um, obscenity is a very narrow category that I think shrinks as our society becomes more immoral, right? As we become more messed up as a society, things like, oh, that's normal, right? That's okay, whatever, that's no big deal. The category of stuff that's obscene is shrinking to a sliver. And I'll give you some examples after you do Miller that they'll, you'll have to go wash your, wash your mouth with soap after it, right? But it's, it's bad stuff. Colby, is your hand up? Oh. Okay. All right, anything else on, um, on Stanley? All right, let's do, uh, let's do Miller. I think David or Gabe or Carlo, I can't remember who's next, somewhere in there. Her. Carlo, you next? Okay, yeah, Carlo, okay, I think you're next. All right, so I'll get some of you in a second. So again, Stanley was about the right to receive information. Miller is something different. Miller is about the right not to receive information. Right, it's about the right to stop people from mailing stuff to me through the mail. Now, uh, 
Uh, actually, Carla, give me the facts, and I'll jump in after that. Um, well, the, I believe Miller was sending uh, advertisements, brochures, brochures, and books, and videos, and <laughs> describes what I guess my title, um, what some of these items were called. And, uh, I'll read the titles because you're being nice. Uh, the, the books were entitled Intercourse, Man Woman, Sex Orgies Illustrated, <laughs> and an Illustrated History of Pornography, and a film entitled Marital Intercourse. Oh my God. And I'll read it. Sounds boring? <laughs> what you say? <laughs> oh God. Oh man. <laughs> Who's downloading the hat? I mean, that's just, that's, that's. Nobody ordered that one. <laughs> no one's ordering that one, oh God. While the brochure contains some. Oh my God. While the brochure contains some descriptive printed material, they primarily consist of pictures and drawings. Pictures, drawings. Uh, depicting men and women in groups of two or more, <laughs> engaging in a variety of sexual activities with genitalia, often, but not always, Displayed. Okay, Carla. Okay, go on with the facts. What happened? So, uh, I read it so you didn't have to. These materials, as you said earlier, the materials wound up uh, a person uh, who was, I guess, with his mother. And, <laughs> okay, that's, that's not mine. I didn't order it. So, Gabe, you want to say I something? Say a <laughs> yeah, go for it, man. <laughs> oh, you have a. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I put the year, and some of the images were kind of like obvious. Like you couldn't like. They were very concentrated on the. On Genitalia. On the titles. On the titles. Oh, I heard a different. Okay, so you thought they were not so well, bad. Well, you know they were. You know. I'm not gonna show them on the screen. Yeah. But <laughs> I uh, uh, I know I I've looked at them, I I've Googled them also, but I'm not showing them up there. Okay. But but I, I take your point. So I can see why they're wrong. Freak, freaked out. Right, so again, I, I don't know if this was actually a setup. Um, some of you may remember this. Um, there, there was a scene, or there are various scenes in Disney movies, right? Which are claimed to be like, now you know, sex. So there's a scene in The Little Mermaid where, the, where, where Ursula is getting married, and then the bishop bows down, looks like he has an erection. It's probably his knees, right? And then on the, on the VHS, the video cover of The Little Mermaid, there's a castle, and one of the spires in the castles looks like a, a, a penis. Yes, thank you. And there's another scene in the, I think it's in Lion King or Aladdin, Lion King, where they write sex in the sky in, with the stars, with, you know, Simba, and, right? So it, it's, it's effects, yeah. So, but my point is, th there was a very famous incident where apparently a four-year-old child found when you freeze frame, you couldn't pause, you had to push pause in the VHS, right? When you freeze frame the VHS, a video, that you see like, you know, the word sex, that a four-year-old found it. And no one believed it, of course, it's always, so this entire story is like, oh, my poor mother saw this. Yeah, it's probably not true, right? They were trying to shut down these smut films, right? The same way you get like basically emails for pornography today, you get in your mailbox. They would mail you these catalogs, they'd mail you brochures, hoping that you buy or subscribe to whatever, you know, service these guys were selling. And they gave, Googled it, you can do the same, I won't do it up here. Um, and, 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 you know, it's, it's porno pornographic materials, right? Do you want this stuff in your mailbox? So at, at bottom, this case involves a right not to hear, but also involves the right of Miller, right? Miller said that he had the right to ship this stuff out. He had a right to shift this stuff out. Now, we've actually done a case before, Andrew, so if you think of it, that is similar, right? Or cases that are similar about making a crime to mail stuff out. What case does this bring to mind? Oh, one of the ones from the first of the week, the, uh, yeah. the flyers, the pamphlets. Bingo, the communist socialist, right? There is a very mm -hmm. long history of cases in which the Postal Service would not accept certain materials to mail. So we did cases the first week of the semester involving mailing socialist propaganda, right, at AOC, right? Uh, <laughs> no one got that one, good. There it is, right? They actually prohibited you from shipping out socialist propaganda 
using the mails. They prohibit you from shipping out pornographic materials. And today it's like, oh yeah, big deal, so what? We'll use FedEx, right? Or we'll use UPS, or we'll just email it. That didn't exist. If you couldn't mail something through the US Postal Service, it, it was done. This is, I think, my dad's comment earlier. If you're a business owner and you can't mail your inventory out, you basically have to resort to the sort of stores we park in the back, right? You can't get this stuff in mail order. And by the way, there was a huge stigma of even going to a pornographic store, which is why you had the direct mail, which is why you had the, the home service, because you didn't want to be seen walking to one of these stores. So this was a huge case. And I think they basically, you know, not quite engineered a test case, but they said, oh, my poor mother saw this and she was devastated. And you know, then they, they, they called the prosecutor and they arrested Miller. Okay, so everyone with me so far. All right. In the Miller case, the court tries to do what they couldn't do before. There were a lot of cases, which I didn't assign you, where different justices offer different tests to distinguish mere pornography, which is fine, from obscenity. Now, Gabe, don't give details, but did you think that the pictures in this catalog were like really bad that would be obscene? <laughs> oh, maybe I shouldn't ask that. I'm sorry. Don't answer if you don't want to. I'm sorry. That's an unfair question. But uh, I, you know, just I'm going to withdraw the question. I'm sorry. But the, <laughs> I have to be very careful with this class. I'm trying as, as best as I can. Um, the question then becomes was this obscene? Right? Did it cross that line? Ah, okay, and that's actually, I like your answer, it depends who sees it. And that's more or less where the court falls down, right? The court doesn't give any sort of bright line test. They more or less give it to the jury, these are jury trials, for the jury to decide with some advice. So let's walk through the case, right? First, they say that, that the state has a legitimate interest in prohibiting the dissemination or exhibition of obscene material. Okay, so the state has an interest here in prohibiting this. They're basically admitting that this is a content-based restriction. Generally, a content-based restriction is reviewed with strict scrutiny. So what they're saying here is, we agree this is basically strict scrutiny, but the state has a really good reason to prohibit this speech from going on. We have a compelling, legitimate interest in banning this. Now, the Roth case, which was mentioned earlier, gives a test, right? They say you can ban obscene, lewd, lascivious, or filthy materials. Okay, those words are not very helpful, all right? So the court walks through this test. Joyce, you want to walk me through, please, what became known as the the Miller test, and that's where I was in court like a month ago telling about the Miller test. This is, this is still litigated. What's the Miller test? Um, so it says the basic guidelines for the trial class must be whether the average person applying the contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appears to the same interest. Okay, well, well, let's go one at a time, right? Thank you. That, that's the first part, right? <laughs> I want to just break this down one at a time because a lot of these things seem to overlap. So first off, for it to be obscene, it must be sexual conduct. So pictures of 3D printed guns cannot be obscene. I explained that to the, to the court, right? Second, the conduct must be described by statute. In other words, it's not enough to have a statute banning obscene material. The statute must actually define what exactly is prohibited, which makes it easier to know what, easier to know what the law is. It's not a vagueness issue. Okay, so let's go to the first factor. It says, whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that the work taken as a whole appeals to the prurient interest. All right, Joyce, let's come back to you. What the heck does that mean? Yeah. 
Exactly. What, what does it mean to have an objective standard? So it wouldn't be your own personal like, Good. Yeah. Yeah, very good. So imagine, right, you, you put like, you know, Hugh Hefner on a jury, right? Or Larry Flint. Um, his idea of what is obscene is very different than if, it, you know, you have, you know, a priest or, you know, a bus full of nuns, you know, the proverbial... Uh, 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 <laughs> well said. Um, see where I get it from. Uh, <laughs> it's about an average person, an average person who's applying contemporary community standards, right? Ruth, what's the significance of that word contemporary? Why is that actually a fairly important word uh, 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 for the first element of this test? Bingo. Right. What what was obscene in 1970, was it 73 in this case? Was not obscene in 1980? Was not obscene in 1990? Hell no, not today, right? Um, I mean, we've just become an absolutely debased society uh, where, uh, you know, you can Google anything. What's that rule number? It's a rule number, right? You can Google anything and find pornography about it. There's a rule about it. It's some rule number something. But basically, you can Google anything and find it. Um, contemporary is actually a very important word. What the court was trying to say is we're not laying down any fixed rules in time. And that this has to be judged based on your contemporary community standards. Now, Jesse, the court makes a few points about which community is relevant, right? Location. Walk me through that. It's a little, a little bit of an odd thing, right? So, actually, um, I'm from Mississippi. You are, okay. So the community standards in Mississippi and the Bible Belt are much different than New York or <gasps> California. God forbid, Vegas, yeah. Which I think the court talks about. <laughs> yeah, right, poor Las Vegas, they get dumped on, right? right. Oh, it wasn't allowed? It was on the cable? because it was considered to be, maybe obscene is not the right word, but it, it yeah. And Where in Mississippi are you from? Vicksburg. Vicksburg, okay. So, yeah, I mean, based on the community where you live, so. Now, now Jesse, do we usually think of constitutional rights varying based on where you are? I mean, you know, could you have a right to an abortion in California but not in Vicksburg? Or, or could you have a Fourth Amendment search that's valid in New York but not in Montana? Is that generally think of constitutional rights? Or, or, or maybe that Second Amendment rights vary in New York and in Wyoming? Justice Breyer actually adopted them in Heller. If you actually go through his Heller opinion, he makes the point explicitly that gun rights should vary based on your local circumstances. Um, but that's generally not how we think of constitutional rights, right? We should think of whatever the right is, Supreme Court tells us we got this thing from coast to coast. You have the same right to this in New York as you do in California, as you do in Virginia, right? As you do in Maine or Mississippi. They, you know, they, they mention Mississippi, don't they? Mm -hmm. From Maine to Mississippi, New York or Las Vegas, those poor places. John, you're back. Yeah, sorry. It's good. Lexus lab problems. Lexus lab problems, okay. <laughs> it just seems weird to me because when I think about the founders and ten, I was like, well, they had nude paintings there, so they couldn't necessarily be against it. And then I thought about, well, it's not implied. It's kind of implicitly in the first, right? Why didn't they just kick it to nine instead or ten and say, well, it's not defined really here. Let the states have their way. Well, the states have a police power, right? Yeah. To regulate the health, safety, welfare, and morals. But, and so I, I, I agree in the first minute because I'm just wondering why they didn't strike harder on those grounds instead. The Ninth Amendment? Yeah. It's not necessarily speech. Oh, you're saying that the states have a greater latitude to prohibit pornography than the I federal government? They should. Uh, going back to this test, which is basically saying, well, the states and the localities. Well, basically. well, how's that work then? I'll go, I'll go to a Roxy. Roxy, what happens if it's a federal prosecution, right? Which community standard applies? Bingo. So during the Bush administration, there was a very prominent obscenity prosecution, right? Now, you have obscenity that's viewed nationwide, right? 
Where did they decide to prosecute the guy? Utah. <laughs> they prosecuted him in Utah, which might be more conservative than Mississippi, but just, just, by, just by a smidge. I don't know. They might, might, you know, have to, you have to have, a, have a Bible off, right? See who wins. Um, but I was in Salt Lake City last week. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, and actually, if I recall correctly, I think the guy was acquitted. He wasn't convicted. Um, but yeah, when you have a federal prosecution, it's a little bit tougher, right? If you mail your materials to all 50 states, they can prosecute you in the most conservative district, hoping to get a conviction. If your stuff's on the internet, which everything is nowadays, what community do you apply, right? What the hell is the contemporary community standards of the internet? Would anyone even attempt to define that? My God, it's an awful place. Awful, the internet's an awful place. Place. All right. Okay, that's contemporary community standards would find the work taken as a whole. That's actually an important point, right? Let's say you have an hour-long movie and like a five-second scene that's really gross. You have to watch the entire work. Um, the entire magazine, the entire video, whatever the hell it is, right? So it's got to look at it as taken as a whole. Then we have appeals to the prurient interest. Who here Googled prurient last night? I sure I never know what the word means. It means appealing to sex. It, it, right? But it has to appeal to a prurient interest. That's basically automatic. All right, so any questions on the first factor? Again, it's strange that it applies differently in different parts of the country. Uh, it, it's, it's not normal. Usually rights are fairly consistent. I'm sorry? I heard. Oh, just, so it's an objective test, but they apply subjective thoughts. Oh, boy, yeah. Yeah, don't pretend this is objective. This is hard to apply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kyle? It's not about the fifth factor, but I'm having an issue grasping why period, and, well, let's just say sex things are yeah. so obscene. Like, if you look at, if you, if the test is that it does not contribute to the social, that it has no social worth, right? right. No social redeeming value, that's why we don't want it. Spam has no social redeeming value, but I get it all the time, and I have no means of bringing a criminal prosecution or calling the police so there's, I'm getting too much junk mail. There's a federal law called the Can't Spam Act, which actually does you a cause of action for spam. Okay. Um, the better one is, if you ever get text messages, uh, this is actually, if you ever get spam text messages, this is actually serious. The penalty is per message sent, so you actually get money out of it. Sweet. It's hard, though. Yeah, but I hear your point, right? The court doesn't apply this test anything except for sex, right? Usually speech is protected, like 3D gun stuff. But it has this unique place in our history, whatever it is, that they're willing to carve out an exception. And Ken, was your hand up? Yeah. I was wondering, you were talking about how, you know, how they, how they were oddly you know, different, you know, state to state, you know, different. Places. County to county, okay. right? If, 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 you, if, you know, if you're in Jackson versus Vicksburg, different, different, different stuff. And we didn't have the case, but unless I'm mistaken, in Roth is when they say the obscenities, it's not a protected, at least public obscenity and that stuff is just not the first in an issue. It's not a protected. But this is deciding when it's obscenity, right? This is a three factor test you decide. Is it obscenity or is it merely pornography? Mm -hmm. If it's pornography, then they can't restrict it. In fact, there were a lot of cases, I don't think I've assigned any of them, involving uh, uh, adult strip clubs, right? Adult theaters, right? Is a pole dance protected speech, right? Can the state force a adult actress on a stage to cover herself up? And there were actually cases, I'm not joking, where a strip club put on recitals of Shakespeare where they basically perform Shakespeare in the nude. I can't vouch for their accents and their, you know, their, 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 their you know, but you know, they, 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 they put on productions of Shakespeare in the buff. The Woods of Dunsinane, as it were. Okay. Uh, What's that? There's a new, new Star Wars. Is there? Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. I'm not going there. OK. Uh, you're my only hope. Uh, <laughs> oh, I don't want to know. I don't want to stop. OK. It's OK. Uh, um, I, I got stuff. I'm not going there. OK. What else? So anyway, then, on the first factor. Dyer, help me. What's the second, um, the second factor of the, the Miller test, please? Whether the work de depicts or describes in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable state law. Okay, thanks. So 
Dyer, help me out here. Patently offensive. <laughs> help me out here. Uh, okay. So is that an objective or a subjective test? What was even was even look like? Yeah, yeah, I mean, once you start actually applying this, it starts getting really tough real quick to actually make any sense out of it. It seems like this, oh, great, a three-factor test. I love three-factor tests, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of stuff in each factor. John, is your, is your hand up on that one? No, I'm just thinking if it's that on the line, then it, it should pass. It should be okay protected. Yeah, but if it's obvious and patently, like, that's definitely porn. Not porn obscenity, be careful. Obscenity. Yeah. But then you have cool things like what Caligula was like, I don't know what that was. Was that pornography or a documentary or the search for fire in the 80s where it was like, I don't know which it was. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not going to Google those either. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not Googling those. These are like massive things from like the 80s and 70s. Helen Mirren was in it. Yep. It's a really good thing. It's just a really, don't watch it with your mom. I would. <laughs> She's, <just, laughs> <laughs> She's having fun. Cameron. Okay, it feels like there's a big, like, almost as if like A and B were written by two different people. Because when A talks about, well, if the average person saw it and viewed it this way, whereas B was saying it's just patently offensive. Which, and when I hear something patently means like there's no argument. Like it is offensive. Maybe it's like yeah, it's right? not in the line. It's easy. Yeah, easy call. JC. But then they rope it back together with the applicable state law, so then they to make it look like they're leaving. Okay, yeah, I was going to get there a second. So, Carl, let me call you on that part, right? Sexual conduct specifically defined by the applicable state law. <laughs> oh, boy. What, what does that mean? What, what does that, can, can the statute just say we ban obscenity, or it's got to be more specific? Be more specific. And what they, I mean, you don't have to give me any specifics, but what does it actually have to say? The actual act. Yeah. So, let's just, oh, God. It bans masturbation. Right, I'll give you a non that non terrible one, right? But it gets worse, right? I'm, I'll give you worse ones in a few minutes. Uh, I, f I found a case from 2014 that's pretty bad. Well, don't we have two examples here? Yeah, give us to a dire. Please help me. Yeah, they say that patently offensive representations or descriptions of ultimate sexual acts, normal or perverted, actual or simulated. And they actually have examples: yeah. depictions uh, of masturbation. Excretory functions and lewd exhibition of genitalia. So I, I don't know what the last one is. Lewd exhibition. That that seems to the exception that swallows the whole. Oh boy. Oh god. Oh, that was bad. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, mom. <laughs> I'm in trouble. Okay. So the excrement, but what about South Park, Mr. Hankey? Like, they literally had talking crap. <laughs> was it sexual, though? But was it, was Mr. Hankey sexual? No. No, he was not. It was, a, it was Christmas poo. It was very <laughs> festive. Oh, God, I'm getting fired. Um, but the important part is they have to actually define it. And this, is, this is, might be more tough than it thinks. You actually have legislators who can come up with the most bizarre messed up things that people can do, and if their statute's not precise enough, then it's fine. They can't criminalize it. All right. Anyone else in factor number two? Yeah, Dyer. Is this number two just included because they just decided that it, it, since it has to have strict scrutiny, it has to be narrowly defined, and this is, this is the narrowly defined? Yeah, I line. think. I mean, if you think about it, if you have a factor, a three-factor test with like eight factors in each factor, right? right? It's almost impossible to meet this test, right? And it's N, not OR, right? You have to check all the, right? You have to check all the boxes, A, B, C. And really, this is not just A, B, C. It's like A through F, right? There are like eight or nine different things you have to think about. Uh, Alicia, want to give us the last one, please? Uh, factors, the third factor. Uh, yes, and whether the work taken as a whole lacks serious artistic, literary, political, or scientific value. Okay, this is the important one, and this is actually where a lot of the litigation turns. Alicia, why is this one so significant? Um, because like what Marshall said in Stanley, uh, let me find it here in just a minute. Mm -hmm. um, obscenity is devoid of any ideological content. And so if, it, if, the, if the work taken as a whole, mm -hmm. not just a piece, 
Good. Lacks any serious artistic, literary, or political, or scientific value, then it cannot be considered obscenity. Okay, very good. Right, right. So there are pieces in literary works that may be considered obscene, but the whole part of it is not. The whole entirety is not. Okay, so this actually goes back to a doctrine we discussed in um, uh, in uh, the O'Brien case, right? Where the state had an interest in banning draft card burning because they wanted to have an effective selective service. They did not have an interest in banning war protests, right? So often you have the situation where the state might be banning speech for reason number one, but really banning for reason number two. This is similar, this doctrine, right? It's saying, okay, we're banning it because of obscenity, and also we don't like the ideas being conveyed. So, you know, John mentioned a few documentaries saying, oh, we're going to ban this documentary because there's sex in it, but actually they don't like the content of the documentary. So this, this last factor is checking, does this law have any scientific, literary, artistic, political value? If it does, then it's fine, right? If you're engaging in some really messed up, obscene stuff, and you do it while talking about, you know, Aristotle, you're fine which is why they had these naked Star Wars or, or Shakespeare presentations. They're trying to redeem it. In fact, I, I was telling the judge two weeks ago, judge, we have artistic value. These are displayed in art galleries. These are political statements opposing gun control laws. I hit all the, checked all the boxes. Wouldn't eventually, okay? And again, it's taken as a whole. So again, if you have like an hour long movie and there's a five second scene in the middle, you look at the work as a whole. Okay, everyone with me? They make this test very tough to satisfy. With good reason, they say, look, we don't want to ban medical books needed to train physicians to talk about anatomy. We want to have a fairly tough test. And at the end, they kick it to the jury. They say, this will be regulated by judges and juries and rules of evidence and presumptions of evidence. And this will allow the government to regulate hardcore, whatever that means, sexual conduct, defined by the regulating state law as written. Okay, so any questions in the Miller test? It's, it's just called the Miller test now. That's how it's called. Uh, Ryan and Carlo? Does this only apply to like, overtly sexual things? Or yes. Or? Yes, only for sexual stuff. Yeah. yeah. Carlo? So because the third factor or the third step is the most important? Yeah, I think so. Is that where you would start if you had yeah. to analyze? Yeah. Yeah, and, and in fact, um, there was a case that I read about, I'll, I'll, I'll mention, I, I keep teasing it, uh, but it was meant, uh, uh, the case called United States versus Isaacs, Ira Isaacs, he made his mother very proud. Um, he published <laughs> a website depicting, I'm just going to read from the opinion, bondage, violence, defecation, urination, sadomasochism, sadomasochism bestiality, oh God, scat, and one other thing I'm not going to say, too much, right? Uh, I'm going to spell it. A K K E. I don't know how to pronounce it. Yes, thank you. Oh, God. So, yes, Ira Isaacs made his mother very, very proud by publishing this website. He was actually convicted of developing and selling these movies involving animals, horses, feces. Messed, messed up stuff. Uh, he acknowledged that most of his movies were purchased on the internet, and he shipped them by the postal service. Um, a huge component of the trial was that Mr. Isaacs wanted to qualify himself as an expert to testify about the artistic value of his movies. And I swear, there's actually an opinion from the court on Daubert, if you take an evidence, right, of whether he can be qualified as an expert to assess the artistic value of his pornographic films. The judge disallowed him, saying that, I, I read the opinion this afternoon, the best evidence of whether something is obscene is to actually watch it, not to have an expert tell you about it. So basically, the guy who made these movies wants to be his own expert. And he was not qualified. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's a shock artist. That's a good point. No, he, the jury had to actually watch the film. And they have no right to not see it. 
So this case went on forever. The first time there was a mistrial, um, the jurors could not agree on how to apply the Miller test. Shocking, right? The jury split 10 to 2. 10 wanted to convict, 2 uh, didn't find him guilty of obscenity. They retried him later and they actually found him guilty of one count of obscenity. Among all the movies, they found him guilty on one count. He got 48 months in prison, so four, year, four years in jail. Again, four years in jail for making movies. Um, let me just give this one point. They, this phrase, prurient interest, Kyle, we were talking about it before. Um, you'll learn this when you go to trial ad, but one of the most important things of a trial lawyer is the instructions, right? What instructions do you give to the jury? And they fought over how to define for the jury prurient, because it's not a word that anyone actually uses, right? I, I, I never use that word, do you? So the judge came up with this instruction. Prurient means morbid, degrading, or unhealthy interest in sex. Morbid, degrading, or unhealthy interest in sex. I don't know. I don't know how they convicted based on that. I would have hung the jury. This is why I didn't pick for jury duty, because I would, I would hang every jury. Um, not, not, that's not conviction. But he was actually prosecuted in federal court under a federal obscenity statute. And this was, his opinion was aff affirmed on appeal in 2014 by the Ninth Circuit. It's an it's opinion. So yeah, U.S. v. Isaacs, Ira Isaacs. OK. Again, this is the sort of stuff that is very rare. I was only able to find a couple of obscenity cases in recent years. And I'm actually surprised that the uh, government got a conviction. I thought, I thought the guy was going to walk on that one, but they actually got a conviction on it. Yeah, Joyce. Uh, I think, yeah, talk about all of them. All of them. But I, th I, think, I think Carlo is, is correct that among the three factors, the third factor is probably what's going to get you, uh, get you acquitted. Mm -hmm. Right, and again, the guy was trying to show that the movies he made about these things, which I'm not going to repeat, um, had artistic value independent of their sexual uh, gratification. Yeah, Carlo. There was actually something in the news uh, this past week for a man in Westview was arrested for offering to uh, create a video with one of his dogs. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, animal, I mean, so don't you just make this point, right? Animal abuse is a different story because animals can't consent to those sorts of acts, right? Um, Animal cruelty is a different deal altogether. When you have actors and actresses in a film, they can consent to the act. Uh, there was another obscenity prosecution for a movie you may have seen. Mom, close your ears. Uh, two girls, one cup. And that, I, I, think, I think that resulted in an acquittal, if I remember correctly. I think that was the Utah case, but I might be, I might be wrong. But I mean, that's, I'm not, I'm not saying anything more, but. <laughs> <laughs> No. no. I don't, I don't want to know. Uh, okay, so any other questions in the majority in, in uh, I picked the right class? I should, I should have just flipped and done like the funeral protesting case today. Um, what, and, what yeah. about the 80s with Tipper Gore wanting to like censor explicit music and CDs? And that yeah. Even with the stickers on it now, and isn't that kind of an infringement of rights? Because I feel like. Well, the obscenity stickers on, on, on CDs are explicit. not mandatory, they're, they're, they're voluntary by the recording industry. Are they? Movie ratings, video game ratings, all voluntary. They'd rather regulate themselves than then let the government step in. Was yeah, back then, Tip, yeah, Tipper Gore, who, who was then Al Gore, was a senator from Tennessee. His wife was the uh, champion to ban uh, violence in media. Uh, yeah, where are we are today. What's up? It did not work. No, it did. not Oh, I'm sorry. That. Oh. <laughs> that. Isn't this a larger conversation in the context of culture and how culture 
changes and yeah. would be artists if we're gonna, going to consider that person an artist. <laughs> There's some that are really on the fringe and may never become mainstream in the culture. And but what happened in the '60s and what happens now is now it's so accepted because the culture keeps changing. Yeah. So it's a moving target. So maybe people live in Mississippi in a certain city because they value those. That in Utah, they value that culture. So it's a reflection of the, of the society. So yeah. I, I just don't know where the, the government comes in. And, and if I could flip that, if you freeze it, if you say you can't be on the fringe today, then the, that, that prevents society from moving. Right? So whatever is you know, normal today was in the fringe 15 or 20 years ago. And it's always a moving target. I guess the, the arc of the universe is long and it runs towards porn. Um, with, <laughs> uh, it was not MLK. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, does the the status of the person acting or even distributing it matter in terms of like how the community views them? And I guess I'm thinking of like, is Kim Kardashian more protected oh, than God. a no name, you know, actor or actress? Uh, are you asking? Is the identity of the? Well, because she's more accepted. By a wider range of so she engages in an act. Does that make it cool? Or does that make it acceptable? As opposed to someone who doesn't have as much acceptance, like within the community. If that's one of if that's oh, I, 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 I think I think I understand your question. So I, th I think just correct me if I'm wrong, but if you have a prominent person engaging in activity, does that person's notoriety make the activity more palatable? Does the newsworthiness make it acceptable as a whole? Think about Madonna when she feels. Yeah, yeah, I think Madonna's a good example, right? I mean, if someone's on the fringe, they're on the fringe for a reason because they're not generally accepted. If you have a very famous person that's doing something, that makes it acceptable, right? If, if you have a celebrity who goes out on a limb and does something and they say, oh, that's cool, you know, Kardashian's doing it, right? Versus someone you never heard of, let's prosecute them for obscenity. She was provocative. Provocative, yeah. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know exactly what the Kardashian obscenity is, but I don't. <laughs> You know, I've made, I think, seven years teaching without talking about Kardashian and Kamala, but I think it's a sad day. Uh, I've mentioned her in property because of the diamond ring and whether she can give it back or not, but it's the first time I mentioned her in Kamala. Okay. Any non-Kardashian West questions? Any? Okay. Justice Douglas was a lone dissenter. Uh, this was towards the tail end of his career. Um, he was a strident liberal. He believed... The obscenity is not mentioned in the Constitution, <clears throat> that all these tests are irrelevant. He writes me, he writes, what shocks me may be sustenance for my neighbor. Sustenance. Um, he writes that there's no captive audience, that no one's being compelled to look or listen, which I think the majority glosses over that idea. And he also says that you can't ban offensive speech. He says, the, I may think this material is garbage, but so much of what's said in political campaigns, on the press, on TV, is also garbage. Amen, William. And he says, if you want to ban obscenity, amend the Constitution. Uh, there were efforts to try and amend the Constitution to ban obscenity. These cases were very unpopular. I don't, I mean, Mom, you probably remember this. Back in the 70s, the obscenity thing, this was a huge issue, right? The government really wanted to ban this stuff. This was like, this was a, a, a huge thing. Uh, and the idea that the First Amendment prevents the state, like Mississippi, from banning obscenity, these were very controversial. You had movie theaters being shut down. You had books being taken off the shelves. This, this was a huge issue that today is like, ah, oh, whatever. All right, just Google it. It doesn't matter. Uh, South Park. Back to the 70s. That was like the 50s. 50s, yeah. Oh, I was just thinking about, do you know the show The Waltons from the 70s? So the, the lore of that show is that... Um, CBS put it on as a joke, sort of a joke, because because um, they didn't believe it would survive, because so many people were backlashed against all this censorship in the media, yeah. and then it ended up so being on TV for 15 years or something like that, because people weren't sure. so, Okay. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Uh, any other questions on Miller? Again, the Miller test is used but it's often used in a uh, in a roundabout way about whether this is artistic or not a lot of the litigation often turns on the third factor 
Okay. Yeah, John. It just seems like this test is so ripe to be overturned that. I don't think it's good law anymore. Okay, so most courts wouldn't touch this. No, but I'm, I'm telling you, there are prosecutions in recent years. This one in 2014 for the Isaacs guy. But I mean, it's really hard to reconcile this test with a lot of the court's other decisions. I mean, you know, Snyder versus Phelps, right? What the Snyder's, what, 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 the, uh, what the Phelps did pales in comparison to what, you know, I mean, it, it's so much worse than what this guy made in his movies with the funeral protesting, right? And if that sort of conduct that shocks because it's non-sexual, I mean, again, the distinction is you can protest a person's funeral, but because it's non-sexual, it's fine. But, you know, if you held up a, I don't know, a, a penis at the funeral, then it wouldn't be okay. All right, this just this seems like a line that just doesn't that doesn't that doesn't fit. Yeah, Jesse. I mean, the people of those things. I mean, they're holding signs, and if you get parked on the street, I mean, just did they? I don't know. Did the God hates bags? And it has like the images of two men having anal sex. I mean, how is that not sexual conduct that is, you know, whatever all these prurient? Yeah. Mean, yeah. Yeah, again, I, I think John, I think Jesse asked good questions. Um, the Miller test, I think, is premised on a different era of protection. Um, and I, again, I, there are very few obscenity pr uh, prosecutions that go forward, and I don't know how sustainable these are. Yeah, Kyle. Um, I wanted to comment on her Snyder comment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, 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 that's exactly right. I mean, you couldn't prosecute this under the third factor of the Miller test, right? But I, th I, think, I think the point more broadly is um, why are we only putting uh, sexual type speech to this higher standard, right? Why can't a funeral protest also be put to this higher standard, mm -hmm. right? Why is obscenity an exception to the First Amendment, but funeral protests aren't? I would say that neither one, sh the, the higher standard should not exist. Bingo, which, which means that the Miller test should probably go away. Which I think was the question that was asked a minute ago. Um, yeah, right. In other words, we keep saying there are exceptions to free speech. You have defamation, fighting words, and the court says no more. Right? We're not going to create new categories on protected speech. Why does this category still exist? I don't know. Our call. I mean, Frank, psychologically, we all seem to deny sexuality for the last few decades. And Yes. Well, up until then, it would have been totally normal to be like, no, you're not showing any knee. <laughs> but it was also, they were also, I think, banned any sort of, you know, I mean, at the time Grizzle was decided, it was a crime to fornicate. It was a crime to have sex outside of marriage. It was a crime. I, I think I told you this wasn't, it was Frank Sinatra. Mom, you know this? Frank Sinatra was actually arrested for fornication. There's a very famous mugshot of Frank Sinatra. You've probably seen it before. He was arrested for having sex with a married woman. In New Jersey, I think in Bergen County somewhere. It was a crime. He wasn't prosecuted. It was a long story, but he was arrested. Yeah, Roxy, go ahead. Even under the second one, I mean, the specificity mm -hmm. would just be constantly have, <laughs> yeah. just have to change it. Constantly. Keep updating the statute as, as people get more messed up, right? Right, because then you think you've gotten this far, and then someone else comes up with and if you try and use too broad language, the law becomes vague. It's not specific enough. Right. So you have to have this really granular, knit by knit law of all the different sex acts that are prohibited. And then you would have to change it every session. Or <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> People come up with new stuff. I... Right. There's oh. stuff on the books that, you know, like, I think there's space where, you know, there's going to be plenty that. Oh, God. Oh, you're very. Okay. Uh, it, it gets worse for the next case. All right. Um, any any other questions on Miller? All right. Um, uh, who's next? JC, you're next. No, I did. I did. Alicia, I think JC's next. JC, you want to give me the facts, please, in um, Ashcroft versus Free Speech Coalition, 2002. So this is a much more modern case. Well, 17 years ago, but but modernish. Okay, so Ashcroft was the 
attorney general, so he got the target on his back. Uh, well, well, I mean, that's a person who, who you sue when your rights are violated. So, it's, yeah. But by the way, the, I, I added that little graphic before the case. That was my idea. Uh, you, do you want to remember that? Dad, do you remember this? When, when John Ashcroft was attorney general in like 2002 or three, and there was a statue in the DOJ with a, with a naked woman, and he had it covered with a sheet. Do you remember this? Yeah, it's Lady Justice. Yeah, it was basically a statue of Lady Justice, and you shared bare breasts. And he didn't. He liked being in the background, so they actually put like a, like a sheet blocking the view. It was insane. Yeah, yeah. Oh, man, we're, we're gone. Okay, so yeah, go, JC. Not okay, but fake child porn is. Proceed, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so there's a lot of people that are using it. But what, what did the act actually prohibit? Just, let's just be very careful about what the act prohibited. Did this, did this, was this act concerning actually exploiting children for making the pornography? No. 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 Did it ban the possession of actual child pornography, JC? I don't think so. No. What, what was the only thing actually criminalized? Visual depiction, public law, uh, virtual... Virtual, right. There, that's the key point, right? This law was not about banning actual child pornography. This law was not about banning the creation of child pornography, which involves children, right? It was only about virtual child pornography. What the hell is virtual child pornography? Um, you can use computers to create images, right? Perhaps you take a photograph of someone who's above the age of majority, who's over the age of 18, and you can Photoshop it to make them look younger. Um, you can also just use CGI to create like an avatar. Now, um, when I was clerking, this is one of the more disturbing things, I had a, a lot of child pornography cases. The way this usually, you're in federal court, right? You get a bunch of these, right? The way this usually works is they arrest someone for drugs and they search his computer and they find lots of child pornography. And the reason why they bring these charges is it generates a very high sentence. The, if you're exposed to the sentencing guidelines, this thick manual of how uh, federal courts calculate jail time, um, if you have child pornography, each photograph is a different offense. So if you have thousands of photographs, which is not difficult, if you have a hard drive full of them, you're going to jail for maybe 30, 40 years. More than the actual person who abuses a child in many cases. Um, and and it, 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 I'll just explain this because we're on the topic. The guidelines are based on the content of the photograph. So depending on the age of the victim, the sentence is different. So the younger the victim, the higher sentence you receive. Um, and I just want to ex make this point because it's relevant to the case. I had one case uh, when I was clerking where they were arguing about how old a girl was in a picture. And I was actually, you know, the judge is at the bench. I'm sitting right in front of him as a lawyer. Actually, the, 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 the government lawyer said, our expert says she was like five years old. Right? Five years old. And the lawyer says, no, 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 she just looks young. And it's like, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe the photograph was a doctor to make her look younger. That's the background of this law, right? The, the thinking was you, you can't have this where people are downloading these pictures that are photoshopped to make them look younger. Right? That, that's why this law is on the books. And, and I mean, the, these cases are just god awful, right? You know, there's an enhancement if there's any sadomasochism in the picture. Right, depending on the actual content, if she's tied up, right? They have enhancements. So this was a huge issue, and we're now 2000, or 1996, the law. This was just at the beginning of the internet age, where people were able to download these sorts of photographs and, and videos. So Congress was trying to uh, head off at the pass this new technology that could make it very difficult to prosecute. Because imagine my guy was there saying, oh, no, these aren't actually minors. These are just Photoshop. They're actually, you know, girls the age of consent. And then maybe the technology is ambiguous and the guy gets off and doesn't, doesn't get sentenced for them.
right? If you can say, oh no, she just looks like she's six. She's not actually six, whatever it is. Okay? Yeah, I know, sad. Go from happy to sad very quickly in this class. But the, the, these, are, these are some pretty heinous, uh, uh, awful offenses. Which the court finds unconstitutional, of course, right? The court finds this law is unconstitutional. Um, you know, okay. So let's start with the basics. Uh, Kelly, what was Ferber about? They discussed this Ferber case a few times within Ashcroft. What was Ferber about? 1982 or 83 case? Right. Well, what, what, what was Ferber about? Actual yeah. Okay. Ferber was a case involving actual child pornography, and it was a New York case. And uh, Mr. Ferber uh, challenged his prosecution for child pornography, and argued that it was protected by the First Amendment. He argues this wasn't obscene, right? The reason why this was important is that under New York law at the time, you didn't have to satisfy the Miller test to prosecute someone for child pornography. He says, aha, this child pornography doesn't fit under Miller, under the statute, it's not specifically defined, therefore you can't prosecute me for obscenity. And the court held in Miller that child pornography is different. Right? Ryan, oh, JC, yeah. I said Ferber, didn't I? Did I say Miller or say Ferber? No, at the end you said Miller. I'm sorry. My, my, Kelly, my apologies if I did. Ferber, New York versus Ferber, 1982. So, Ryan, why did Ferber, Ferber hold that child pornography is different than the test for obscenity? Why, why is child pornography not considered under the Miller test? Why don't you have to show community standards and specificity and all the other stuff? Exactly, right? With obscenity, you have consenting actors above the age of consent, right? The, the people in the film, being photographed or otherwise, consented to the act. But with child pornography, there's no <laughs> consent. Um, indeed, if you think about it, with animal cruelty, likewise, there's no consent from the animals. It's, it's a somewhat similar doctrine of why you can ban bestiality. Okay. So child pornography can ban regardless of whether it's obscene under Miller. Regardless. It doesn't have to be patently offensive. It doesn't matter if it has scientific literary value. All right. Why? Because the state has an interest in preventing the exploitation of the children. And that interest allows them to ban the end product. Right? If they ban the possession of the child pornography itself, that dries up the marketplace, right? Supply and demand. If you can't possess it, there's no demand for it, therefore people will not make it. Now, that's not true. It's still made. It still happens. Uh, but they say that they can uh, uh, ban it for that reason. That to say it's a special compelling interest to prosecute those who promote sexual exploitation of children. Okay? All right, so you have obscenity under Miller, and you can ban child pornography under Ferber. John, why is Justice Kennedy, uh, why does he, Kennedy here, right? What, why does he uphold this law? What's his thinking? Um, why, why, why can't this be fit under the rubric of Ferber or Miller? I don't know where to start with. It's, <laughs> it's kind of like overly broad, like, okay. And in, oh, okay, and, good. And in, Cutting this out, you're cutting all these things that could be artistic. And I know, I always just thought of it as Romeo and Juliet, like, well, they're 12, but I think it was Leonardo DiCaprio and <laughs> what's her face? And they were clearly like 20. Was it Claire Danes? Yeah. Claire Danes, yeah. So it was like, so what are we punishing? The, the depiction or the actual act? And I think it's the act that they're trying to stop. Yeah, this is, this is Tony Kennedy is worse. Just this sort of opinion, <laughs> just I read like, God. Um, I think I agree with the bottom line, but just the opinion is written very in a way that makes me, you know, it's bizarre. So he says, our society, like other cultures, <laughs> has empathy and enduring fascination with the lives and destinies of the young. What the 
hell. Art and literature express the vital interest we all have in the formative years we ourselves once knew. When wounds can be so grievous, disappointment so profound, and mistaken choices so tragic. But when moral acts and self-fulfillment are still in reach. Yeah, need a paperback for that one. Okay, if you know the reference, uh, Scalia joked in a burger fell, I'd rather put a paper bag in my head than join that opinion, but uh, he, uh, Scalia joins it, right? He walks through that there are lots of um, movies, films, art, in which children engaging in sexual relations are depicted, but it might not actually be a child. So, you know, John mentioned the Romeo and Juliet movie, right? Leonardo DiCaprio was well above the age of consent, I think at least. And he's depicting a 13-year-old. So can that if we allow the statute to go forward, speech that ought to be protected might be sweeped in. Alec. I was just going to say, um, you know what really blew again with Brooke? She was 14. Yeah. She was actually 14 in the movie. It was, yeah. And I think Interview with a Vampire, wasn't it uh, Kristen Dunst, Kristen Dunst yeah. and Tom, was it Tom Cruise or Brad Pitt? Both. No, they made out. Didn't they kiss? Yeah. That 70s show that came out that Neil Kunis was 14 when she's on that show depicting like she was in high school with Ashley Fisher. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I'm just saying, like, where did, did no one raise these concerns when you know, Brooke Shields was 14 and we were doing that? I think that movie was controversial. Was it? Yeah. Well, let, let's just try and bring this back for a minute, right? John mentioned the phrase overbreath. This is an important doctrine I think I've alluded to a few times before, right? What's overbreath? If a law sweeps in, prohibits a lot of speech, a huge chunk of which might be protected, we say the law is overbroad. <clears throat> Usually, we can only challenge a law if it applies to my speech, right? If my speech. So, for example, if I actually had a defendant in this case who had pornography that was, you know, photoshopped, whatever, you might say, well, what the hell's the value in having photoshopped porn to make the girl look underage? But that's not the approach in the First Amendment. You're not only raising your own argument, you're also raising the argument of everyone. And because this law might sweep in other types of speech that are protected, like Myla Kunis and the Lagoon and vampire movie, right? The law's gone. So the court kills us under the overbreath doctrine. Because again, who's the plaintiff here? It's not a criminal prosecution. It's a free speech coalition, which is basically a group of <laughs> pornographic purveyors, right? They make adult movies. They brought a lawsuit challenging this law on its face. And they argued that some of our members may make movies that could run afoul of the statute. And that existence of the statute may chill expression, right? That if we have some actress who puts on, you know, attire to make herself look younger, then she'd be prosecuted for breaking this law. And because it may result in the chilling of speech, therefore they say this law is unconstitutional and the court agrees. Justice Kennedy says, the government cannot ban protected speech in order to ban unprotected speech. Let me say that again. The government cannot ban protected speech in order to ban unprotected speech. They have to target the unprotected speech with, a, with surgical precision. Where I think of using a scalpel to cut out the bad stuff versus using like a chainsaw and just slicing the entire uh, 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 movie catalog. Nathan. So I didn't, uh, I'm doing an internship with the U.S. Attorney's Office and some other prosecutor that I don't work with had a conviction the other week for, I mean, I, can, I understand why it's not hard for a jury to convict this guy for what he did, but it seems that he shouldn't be based off this case. What he did was, <coughs> It was this grandpa that superimposed his grandchildren's face onto porn stars. So how does that not What, what was the charge was under this statute? It could have uh, been under this statute. I, I don't know. I, I just saw it like on our daily like updates. For <sighs> cases. Well, if you actually photograph the granddaughter, that may have been a different story than merely possessing the image. It may be a child endangerment by putting the photograph on. Uh, Even if it's just your face? I would need to know more facts. But this law is no longer on the book, so this, this is an unconstitutional statute. And this was almost 20 years ago also. Yeah. Yeah. 
mail fraud or wire fraud, it's basically a catch-all. You've all committed wire fraud today. You just don't know it. It means that it has no meaning anymore. There's a, there's a Twitter account called Crime a Day that tweets out these crazy crimes that we all commit every day. There are lots of them. All right, so any question the Kennedy majority opinion? A very cheerful, right? Yeah, very, very rah-rah. Uh, let's talk about, oh, the O'Connor one. I got, I got a story. So we put this little anecdote after the case about Justice O'Connor and Rehnquist, but it gets even, <laughs> gets even more bizarre. And this is actually new. Um, so when uh, William Rehnquist and Sandra O'Connor went to law school, uh, they were at Stanford together. Uh, William Rehnquist was number one in his class. I think O'Connor was like number three in her class, right? Two? Two or three. She, you know, basically right after him, right? So she was a really, really smart student. Um, when O'Connor, I'm sorry, when Rehnquist graduated, he went to go clerk for Robert Jackson, right? Justice Jackson. He was there, the, the term Youngstown was decided. Uh, when Sandra O'Connor graduated, she couldn't find a job as a lawyer anywhere. It just wasn't, wasn't even possible as a female. Uh, she was offered a job as a secretary in law firms. She eventually found a job in her home in Arizona. She worked through the ranks, became an appellate judge. And then apparently when uh, Ronald Reagan was looking for a woman to put in the Supreme Court, Rehnquist recommended O'Connor. Uh, the backstory is that they actually dated in college, in law school. But I didn't know how much they dated. The story was only they went on a few dates. This year, it just came out that they found letters. Get this. They went on 40 dates in 40 days. We call this a psycho, right? That, that's like a clinger. That's, that's a swipe left today, right? That's, that's a ghost, right? You ghost that. But here's the best part. While Rehnquist was clerking the Supreme Court, he sent her a letter on Supreme Court stage. He sent her a letter, okay? What did the letter say? Will you marry me? <laughs> she said no. She turned him down. Dude was clerking the Supreme Court, she turned him down. So that makes it even more mad awkward <laughs> that they became colleagues and several decades later that she turned him down. Now apparently um, many uh, O'Connor's son said many men proposed to her, because I mean she was basically one of the only girls in the entire law school, but she turned a lot of guys down. Good for her. Uh, Rehnquist was a bit of a jerk anyway, probably for the best. He gambled, he smoked. Probably. Her husband was the one. But it's actually a very sad story. Just O'Connor, you might know, stepped down from the court in 2004 or five. Her husband developed uh, Alzheimer's, and she basically stepped down. She was in full health. She's, she's still alive, but she's not as well, but she stepped down in full health to take care of him. And uh, one of the ravages of Alzheimer's is you forget who your loved ones are. And she, he forgot who she was. And he had to move into a home. He actually started dating someone else in the home. You know, It's really sad. I mean, she had a, a, she's a remarkable person. Re, re, read, there are lots of biographies about her. Uh, Ginsburg gets all the attention, but O'Connor was more of a trailblazer in that regard. Um, so very, very sad story. But yeah, this, this Rehnquist O'Connor uh, love game. I, uh, I didn't know about the 40. 40 dates in 40 days. Can you imagine that? My God. Yes. It, who has time to sleep? They were really smart, too, I guess. It, you know, but. Hmm. Yeah, so. I mean, I mean, who are these other girls he dated every day? I mean, my goodness. I, I don't want to know. I think, I think there were only a handful of girls in their, in their class. Uh, I think they went to law school in the late 40s, or I think Rank was graduating in 51 and 52, so I mean 48, 49, so yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but the reason why I put this in your book, it's not just to talk about love stories, is that um, O'Connor and Rehnquist took a unique interest in internet pornography. Um, there was a case in 97 called Reno versus ACLU, which considered the Communications Decency Act, which sought to regulate porn on the internet. And at the time, uh, Ted Cruz, now a senator, was clerking for Rehnquist. And this is a true story. O'Connor and Rehnquist wanted to know how easy it was to look up porn on the internet. So they actually had one of the Supreme Court librarians wheel a computer into their chambers and pull up <laughs> internet porn, see how easy it was back then. Uh, 97. And apparently, I'm going to just read from Cruz's book. He wrote this. He said, um, as we watched these graphic pictures on the screen, wide-eyed, no one said a word. 
except for Justice O'Connor, who lowered her head, squinted slightly, and muttered, oh my. <laughs> and Rehnquist and O'Connor, after marriage rules of watching porn together in the Supreme Court, just did. <laughs> anyway, who, so Noel, give me uh, Rehnquist uh, O'Connor's dis, uh, concurring dissent. What was, what was her point? Yes, yeah, there was. 1997. <laughs> yeah, a little pixelated, you know. All right, Noel, what did Justice O'Connor say? Nathan, what did O'Connor say? Mm. But it oversteps, uh, they overstep their bounds when they uh, criminalize pornography depicting teenagers having sex. Um, why was O'Connor hesitant about the way this case was brought? Why, the, why was she not so happy about this case? Fact that someone may look young. Yeah, J JC? They didn't prove anything. Yeah, there's no evidence, right? This is what's called a facial challenge. A facial challenge means you're challenging the law on its face. And there might be evidence to be proved later. Maybe there are good reasons to have this, right? So there were two categories, right? You had pornographic images of adults that look like children. This is youthful adult pornography and pornographic images of children created wholly on a computer without using any actual children. She says that the ban on the youthful adult pornography is overbroad, right? She, she's okay with that one. But there's not enough evidence to demonstrate that the ban on the virtual child pornography is overbroad. In other words, there's not a lot of value in the virtual child pornography, right? This is not like Romeo and Juliet or Leonardo DiCaprio. This is something that's very different. So she would sort of split the difference, or split the baby as it were. Okay. All right. So any questions on Ashcroft? Yeah, JC. Did they take a stab at enacting like a more narrow piece of legislation? You know, I don't know. Um, and Nathan mentioned a moment ago something that sounds a lot like here. So Nathan, if you can pull up the. Uh, any of the, in the indictment or any of the public documents in the case in sense me, I'd be happy to take a look. Okay. I, I don't know, JC, it's a good question. Because the latter that O'Connor brought up was like, yeah, let's get rid of that. Yeah, in other words, so just, just a ban on the virtual. You know, I was in court last two weeks ago and I made an argument that, you know, um, I could design a, a blueprint for a gun to be used in like Fortnite or some video game. And under the New Jersey law, that's now something that could be banned even if it's not real, because it may be used to create a gun. You can use that and modify it. So I think even if you have the virtual ban under the Ashraf case, it's very difficult to justify, because people can modify something in ways that you didn't anticipate use it for other purposes. All right, anything else on uh, Ashcroft or Miller or Stanley? Mom, anything, Dad? You pick one hell of a class. I'm not a lawyer, right? but I think what this talk demonstrates uh, the limitations of the toolbox, right? Yeah. There's just limitations on what, what could be done. Yeah, yeah. All right, anything else? I will see you all next week. Thank you.